day and night. Uh, the demigods just one year here. So he went back, uh, you know, for one second. But when Krishna could apparently find his boyfriends, couldn't find his his, his calves, he said, well, "What am I going to do when I get back?" The parents, the parents who live for their children, they'll be so sorrowful. They'll not be able to live without their children. But what can I do? Okay, I know what I'll do. He immediately made a whole set of cowherd boys and a whole new set of calves. The calves looked exactly like the calves that were sleeping in Brahma's cave. The boys looked exactly like the boys who were sleeping in Brahma's cave. They looked like them. They spoke like them. They had the same desires as them. You could not tell the difference. So Krishna went home and a very interesting thing happened. As he came into the area of Vrindavan, they were jubilant with their youth, with their horns and their flutes. When the parents, they saw their children, suddenly they began to feel something they had never felt before. Now it should be mentioned here that all those parents who lived in Vrindavan, who had all these children, secretly they all treasured, they cherished a desire to have Krishna as their son. They actually envied, transcendentally envied Mother Yashoda and Father Nanda, Nanda Maharaj. So they envied them, but after all, they were the beneficiaries, we can't change that. But Krishna wanted to satisfy their desire. So when all of the calves came in, and all of the cowherd boys came in, what happened is they felt in their hearts such a super abundance of love as they had never felt before. So when their children approached them, of course they always would pat their heads, give them a little kiss, you know, a hug. This time, they didn't want to let them go. They felt such love, they were even wondering, they couldn't even figure it out. Why are we feeling so much love for our children today that we had never felt before? And the same thing happened in the cow pen. When the calves, they went into the cow pen, the cows immediately started, they saw their calves and immediately they started, mm, mm, they started moving. That was their affection. And they immediately started licking the, the bodies of their calves. More love. Remember this amount. Well, the story goes on. I'm not going to make it draw it out too long. I could be a whole class. So what I'm saying now is this. Finally, Lord Brahma, he came back. And uh, he went to the king where he had put those cowherd boys and the calves. He said, yeah, Krishna never found them. My suspicion was right. He's not my master. He's not my boss. He's a beautiful little child. So then he went down to the pasturing ground where Krishna was, you know, going went for the cowherd boys near the Yamuna River. And what did he see? He saw Krishna and the cowherd boys. He said, well, wait a minute. I just saw them sleeping in the cave. Uh, and now, now they're here. Maybe I didn't see them in the cave. But maybe my mind is getting the best of me. So let me go back to the cave and see if the children are sleeping there. Uh, probably they're not. Maybe Krishna did find them. So he went back to the cave and what did he see? The children were lying there. Now he was in terrible confusion. How can they be lying there when I just saw them on the bank of the Muna? Now let me try one more time. He went back to the bank of the moon, and there they were playing. So Brahma was now totally bewildered. He tried to bewilder Krishna, and he ended up becoming bewildered himself. This was the problem. So Brahma became very confused, very bewildered. It looked like he needed a psychiatrist. He, was, he just couldn't figure out what was going on. Then, to sweeten the pie a little more, Krishna, in all these different cowherd boys, in all these different calves, he transformed them into Lord Vishnu's. They all became Lord Vishnu's, four own forms. Four, uh, and, 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 uh, so, uh, your brother saw all these Vishnu's, and then he also saw all the demigods. In fact, it became so perplexing, so bewildering, he even saw himself there. He saw himself worshiping Krishna. Here he was sitting on the swan, wondering, what's going on here? 
And then all of the different elements, earth, water, fire, air, ether, mind, intelligence, they all assume their, uh, their personified forms, the personified Vedas. And they were all worshiping these Vishnu forms. Now, this is just too much, he says. I must be seeing things, I can't understand it, I don't know what's going on, uh, I don't know from Krishna, from non-Krishna, uh, I was totally confused. So, Krishna saw already the, the confusion had become so great, so intense, that poor Brahma was losing it. <laughs> That's an expression we have, he's losing it, he's, he's going crazy. So what he did is he transformed all the Vishnu forms back into the cowherd boy forms and also the calves. And then he said, my dear Brahma, he said, I know that you had these doubts and I wanted to convince you that yes, I am your master. So you should never have such doubts again. Well, at that point, Lord Brahma, being the pure devotee that he is, the, that mood of the pure devotee manifested. His real mood, his real transcendental expression. And what happened was that he began to worship Krishna. He bowed down to him, he glorified him, he adored him, and he began his most elegant, most eloquent, I should say, prayers. And these prayers that we are going through are part of this. So he actually began to speak the most beautiful prayers, and this is one of them. He said, he's saying here, actually it's translated abdomen that you are in the abdomen, it says. But in, Christ, in the Christian book, it says that Lord Mother Yashoda saw you in, in your mouth. Actually, Krishna was accused of eating dirt by Balaram, and so Mother Yashoda, she said, open your mouth, I want to see if you're eating dirt. Then you're lying to me, so he opened his mouth, and in the mouth, the whole year. So the universal form was there. So this is what this verse refers to. So Brahma is saying that, interestingly, here you are in this material world, and yet the whole material world is in you. He says, this is absolutely amazing. He says, <coughs> who can understand this? Here we are, and every one of us are in Krishna. As it says in the Bhagavad Gita, a true yogi sees me in all beings, and sees all beings in me. Indeed, the self-realized soul sees me, the same Supreme Lord, everywhere. But one who sees me everywhere, and sees everything in me, I have never lost, nor is he ever lost in me. But the humble sage, by virtue of true knowledge, sees with equal vision, a learned and gentle brother, a cow, an elephant, a dog, and a dog. He sees the same Supreme Lord in dwelling all. He doesn't just see a form, but what is manifesting from that form is the soul. You take the soul out of the body, you cut the connection, the body is dead. The difference between a living body and a dead body is the soul. One has soul in it, the other has no soul in it, and it's just like the marble here. So Lord Brahma uh, is, is uttering all of these wonderful prayers, and the interesting thing about it, and this is what we can all learn, is that he apologizes profusely. Whenever we commit an offense, which this was clearly, when you, when you are the servant of a master, it is not proper to test the master. The child does not test the parent. Because respect, having respect means that you don't test. If there's something wrong that the father has done, it is done in a very timid and a very gentle and a very kindly way. But not I want, I will show you, not that movie. That I want to take, not that, not I want to prove to you that you're nobody. So Lord Brahma realized this terrible mistake, and the result was is that he felt guilty, he felt regretful, and he felt uh, shameful, and he begged uh, Krishna to please forgive him. And Krishna said, "Yes, of course I forgive you." Uh, this is one of my pastimes, but I want you to know, Brahma, that you have a very high position. And because you have such a high position, it is natural for you to become a little proud. So you must take counteractable, countermeasures. Uh, 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 counteractive measures. You must tell yourself you're not as great as everybody 
makes you out to be. You must remember me that I am your master, that I gave you all your power, and that without me, you're just nobody. And if you remember this, if we all remember this, we all have some degree, some measure of power in our life. We have jobs, we have your family, we have some power. And sometimes we're honored, sometimes we're glorified, sometimes we're applauded, sometimes we're respected, uh, we're given money, we're celebrated. We have to always remember uh, when this comes, although outwardly we should accept these in a friendly and when somebody gives you love, you don't say, no, I don't deserve to get away from you. You don't do that. That is not proper. When somebody offers you love, you accept it graciously, but you inwardly offer it to the Lord who deserves it. We don't have to make a big show. You know, everybody should see, Lord, take this so that everybody can see how humble I am. <laughs> That's not the idea. It's inward. What you do for show is not humble. It's arrogance. It's, it's, uh, it's nothing more than egotism. And what we want to do is get rid of this egotism so that Krishna can manifest more and more in our lives. So Krishna, Krishna is saying to uh, Lord Brahma, try always, whenever you look, because all the demigods, they bow down to Brahma, they glorify him, they recite prayers to him. Look at Hiranyakashipu. He worshipped him and worshipped him and he got so many incredible benedictions. So Brahma, of course, could get a little puffed up. He can. Actually, he's generally not. But Krishna is saying those things for us. Brahma is already pure. He knows to give them to Krishna. But we may not know to give them to Krishna. And if we don't remember that, we get proud, we get puffed up, we get arrogant, we get into argument, you're wrong, I'm right, you got it, you didn't, you're not understanding the Gita, I'm smarter than you, I'm better than you, I'm greater than you, I'm higher than you, get away from me, I don't want any part of you. This is human life. So Krishna is saying, if you don't want to live a life like that, whatever you do, whatever you eat, whatever you offer, or give away, whatever austerities you perform, please do it for me. If you do it for me, in this way you'll be free from the bondage to work and its auspicious and inauspicious results. With your mind fixed upon me in this principle of renunciation, you will be liberated and you'll come to me. And in another verse, he says to Arjuna, he says, Therefore, Arjuna, you should always think of me in the form of Krishna. And at the same time, perform your prescribed duty of fighting. With your activity dedicated to me, and your mind and intelligence fixed on me, you will come to me without a doubt. So don't forget me. So how do we keep remembering Krishna? Well, you may write the name Krishna on your wrist, or put a K there, put an old symbol on there, put a picture of Krishna on your computer, uh, put pictures of Krishna like we have in this temple, put them all around your kitchen, put them all around your living room, so that wherever you look, you will see Krishna. That prevents us from committing offenses. This Krishna is looking at you. There he is. There he is. He's here. He's right. He's left. He's above. He's everywhere. So, with that final thought, uh, uh, I want to again thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to share with you all these wonderful thoughts that have come to me from Sri Prabhupada and come to us also ultimately from Lord Sri Krishna. Thank you so much. Sri Prabhupada Ki Jai. Before we leave, maybe there are a few questions that any of us have uh, about this verse or about this pastime. If you don't ask questions, I may ask you a question. That's a very good question. The question is, why did Krishna make this bewilderment of this illusion so intense, so strong, that we can't remember Krishna well. Just think about it. If you want to be a Lord, and you can't remember another one, you can't compete. So you have to be alone. To be alone without the real Lord, you have to forget the real Lord. That's one of the five kinds of ignorance. You forget Krishna. There are other forms, I'm going to be talking about them tonight, the five types of ignorance. When we enter this world, different ignorance is given. We forget that we are spiritual, we think with the body, 
We think that the most important thing in the world is to enjoy material pleasure, intellectual pleasure, mental pleasure. So, because we want to be a Lord, we need to have those faculties. So everybody applauds us, compliments us, we love that. We, the taste is good. It's like a drug. So Krishna, 